Good Time Charlie is a legend in the tattoo industry. And if you clicked on this video, you probably already know who Charlie is. But if not, you can check out this video in the corner I made for more context. If you've ever had the pleasure of meeting Charlie in person, you know he's a wealth of knowledge on all things tattoos and has stories for days. I wanted to be able to capture some of that on video for everyone to see. So while coming up with questions to ask Charlie, I thought it would be extremely important to get questions from tattoo artists that are currently in the industry. So thank you to Mr. Trojan, Shine, Gabriel Godinez, and Franco Viscovi for contributing questions for this video. Originally, I wanted this video to be short and concise to please the YouTube algorithm, but there is too much good information and stories to not put this entire Q&A out in the world. After all that set up, we're finally here. Yeah. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you for letting us in your home and allowing us to do this. We really appreciate it. And uh, today, basically, we're just going to be doing a Q&A with you. And I've gathered some of the questions from other tattoo artists. Okay. And then also we have some other stuff that we'll just be filling in along the way. So, all right. Uh, the first one comes from a tattoo artist named Shine. And he says... Uh, do you think there's still an advantage of having a traditional apprenticeship nowadays? Absolutely not. Because it's uh, everything, there's no secrets anymore. It's all uh, just given to you, to anybody that wants to pursue it. From so many different ways you can pursue it. Uh, from videos and books and friends and there's just so much knowledge out there now. Nothing's a secret anymore. It's everything's the cat's out of the bag or the ink's out of the bottle. Obviously, you came from a day and age where you had to kind of really do a lot of work to learn tattooing. It was very secretive. People kept their own secrets and weren't very uh, they weren't very maybe happy to to turn over that knowledge. They wanted to keep everything to themselves right. versus now you can basically find all the information you want online. Right. Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Well, it sure changed tattooing, that's for sure. I, I, I don't know um, hardly how to respond to that because one could think of it as being a positive thing in some ways, sharing all your all you know but if you got no secrets anymore, you know, uh, you're no different than anybody else. If, if we're we're all just the same, if you don't have a certain amount of uh, mystique or, uh, you know, I guess uh, unknown. If you're operating a little bit in in, a, in the mystery area. I think you're always going to be smarter than just laying all your cards on the table. Uh, I remember little Dave Spellman, who I worked with at uh, West Coast downtown Los Angeles, when they would ask him, so how do you get into this business? He said, well, first of all, you've got to have one of these. And one of these was a contraption he made that had gauges and switches and lights and buttons all over it. And it was just a just a, a contraption that really wasn't anything except his power pack inside of that whole thing. But it looked so mysterious. And when he'd say, you got to have one of these, they go, well, where do you get one of those? He said, well, you got to make one. Well, that was the end of the story right there. They, they wouldn't have a clue. A big chrome box with all these light switches and everything going on. So that just kind of nipped that in the bud to start with. But anymore, it, it, it's so different now. Everything's just handed to you on a silver platter pretty much. There is no, there is no such thing as a traditional uh, apprenticeship anymore. Uh, for any reason, there's, I mean, what are you going to do? Teach the guy maybe your own personal operation and, and, and how you would like for the shop to be operated or run, certain little aspects of it. But let's face it, everything is a throwaway. Even machines are throwaway if you want it. They've they got throwaway machines now. So 
there's nothing to learn in terms of, uh, well, being that, I guess you'd say the somebody's workhorse, somebody's pony in the stable, you know, uh, scrubbing tubes and making needles and all, and even mixing colors and all. That's a thing of the past. That's all. That's all lost to, uh, well, lost in time. Uh, things have, have come around to where it's impossible, I would think, for a guy to be a failure in this business. I mean, you got everything you could possibly want. Uh, it's handed to you practically. Uh, with no experience necessary, thank you. You can almost become a tattooer overnight if you so desire. And uh, so, I mean, Walmart makes that even possible for you. So. With that being said, do you think that the best artists will still end up rising to the top and the people that really want to be involved in the industry will, will still have their place? It's always going to be those that are, that shine a little brighter than the rest. Probably, I, I, I won't say necessarily because of skill or product even, but because possibly of the style that they're presenting. Uh, the, and so that influences the product they're producing, obviously. And if, and, and if they, if that becomes caught on by a few I would say athletes or celebrities. If they start something, it's just going to be a big trend from then on. So there's so many ways that people are influenced in tattooing. And uh, <coughs> I, I personally think that anybody that wants to be involved in the business certainly has no no red lights in front of them anymore. I mean, anybody can be involved in this business now. And uh, I see that demonstrated constantly by those who probably should be doing it and plenty of those who shouldn't be doing it. But there will always be room for, I suppose, for... Uh, I'll, we'll just say helpers that maybe would clean the shop, keep the shop clean and book customers and so forth. A counter person, a good counter person that's the combination janitor and, uh, you know, meet and greet type person. The, those are the types of, I would say, helpers that that one could expect to have but 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 I've even heard such silly things as today's apprentices even have helpers now what the hell are we talking about when an apprentice is having helpers I mean what are you what are you helping them do for God's sake I can't even imagine unless you're just drawing every damn thing that the the master wants done and he's putting on the tattoos and you're just tracing out the product or something, but I can't even imagine what what kind of a helper, uh, an assistant, uh, or a so-called apprentice would need. And what kind of an apprentice are you anymore? I don't get that. Uh, what, what are you learning that you haven't, couldn't learn already? I mean, I, I, never, I, I never personally had an apprenticeship myself. Uh, cause I was a self-taught guy, period. And, uh, so I never had that experience of having to scrub toilets and, and, uh, you know, I made my own needles and stuff, obviously. And, uh, but, you know, I never made stuff for other people. I was a, a self-taught tattooer and that's all there was to it uh, even though I did learn other things from other people um, that probably helped me along the way little tips of the trade and stuff 
because you do learn something from everyone you work with, regardless of whether you think you do or not. I remember Dennis Dwyer, Dennis Dwyer told me that he said, I didn't learn a damn thing about tattooing from Cliff Raven, but I learned how to be a businessman. He taught me that. So, see, there you go. The, the application of a tattoo didn't, wasn't, didn't have anything to do with it, but he taught him how to, how to make money and how to really be a businessman, how to charge people for your work and so forth. This uh, next question that I have comes from Dimitri Troshin, also known as Mr. Troshin, and he asks, what do you think about the tattoo industry these days? What's wrong about it and what's cool? Well, the cool thing about it, the only cool thing about it is that it still exists. <laughs> and, uh, and obviously, uh, tattoos are quite popular. They're, I think they're here to stay. There's no doubt there. Uh, the, uh, as far as the business itself goes, one can only guess how this can end up when the whole world is a tattooer. Uh, I, I can't, I can't, I didn't even see how it could last this long with this many people tattooing, but it looks like they're determined. So I guess it's going to be, uh, well, it, it's going to separate the sheep from the goats eventually. Uh, unless there, it doesn't matter whether you're a sheep or a goat anymore. You know, it, obviously it, it doesn't matter to a lot of people the kind of work they even get. So I, I, maybe it doesn't even matter about the quality uh, long term because people, today's clients just seem like they're not interested in anything that resembles quality. All they want to know is how much it is and when can you do it. And so I, I think it's a pretty sad state of affairs for the, for the amateur tattoo collector if they're just going about it that way. But for those that are really in the know, they seek out, they'll seek out the ones who really have the, the uh, product that's in demand. And that's because, that's not because their, their stuff is necessarily more beautiful or any better than anyone else, but it's because of the, the uh, artist himself, his personality perhaps, you know, is what uh, brings about the uh, success that he has. Uh, but, but if you, you can be a real, you can put on beautiful work, but if you're just a, a complete jerk uh, and treat people, you know, with no respect. Well, you're just you're not going to fare very well in this business. You can think it yourself so high and mighty all you want, but ultimately, you're just another one of many out there that are trying to make people happy. And uh, your job as a as an individual is to provide the best experience that they can have and give them the haircut they want, give them good medicine. It is good medicine if people really get a grip on that. Uh, it, it can be good medicine, but it can also be a negative. But it should be a good experience, a positive experience for all concerned. And if a guy, if a tattooer is given someone a tattoo that they want, regardless of how silly or goofy someone else might think it is, including the tattooer that leans over and tells his friend, eh, I'm not into this when you want to do it. Well, right there, that guy just shot himself in the foot because for all you, all he knows, that same guy, if he would have, you would have treated that guy with respect and put that goofy tattoo on that guy, he would have been gratified. You would have been gratified that he's gratified and you got a hamburger out of the deal. So 
that's the way it ought to be. It's good medicine for both both parties. It should be. And I don't know that it can always be that way uh, with so many devil may care attitudes out there about, you know, uh, if you're a smart ass and, and just a get over guy that wants to just do a, be a flim flam man, well, you're going to find that you've got a pretty short life in this business because there are some people that that really get it, and they and they will realize you're getting over. But I th I just think you you should treat them all with respect, and that ultimately may result in you having someone feed you for a lifetime. <clears throat> but that's the way it is. Different people approach it so differently, and so the, to determine how this business is going to turn out in the end, say 20 years from now. It's going to depend a lot on the attitudes that enter the business as well as the technological developments that will take place. I mean, I, I've been asked many times, so where do you see this going? Well, I can envision the day when the personal hand won't have much to do with it anymore. It'll be either be robotic in some fashion or uh, or it'll be uh, achieved through laser photography, etc. I can see it, how it can happen, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But I'm pretty sure it's going to take take that kind of a turn, uh, and uh, and it'll be a completely different thing from what it is now, re regardless of how many changes we see happen, there's still more, many more coming. So <clears throat> this next question kind of goes a little bit with that, but it, uh, this next question is from Franco Viscovi, and it says, what do you think about the technological advancement of tattoo machines, needles, and overall supplies? So maybe you just talked a little bit about where you see it going in the near distant future from yeah. now, but from when you started tattooing to nowadays, how much has that technology changed? Well, completely. Uh, you know, uh, the simplest act of needle making became obsolete uh, when someone decided, well, I can, I'll just make needles and sell them to all these tattooers. Well, that was the need. They found a they found a need, and they uh, developed the uh, demand. You know, the demand was there, and they gave the, they fixed the need for it by having everybody make their own uh, needles. Became obsolete when someone says, "Well, I can, I can do that and just sell them to everybody." I think that the technology technology will never stop because Franco's a, a good example of that the man his brain he wants to just keep going and going constantly doing something that hasn't been done another way to build a better better mousetrap or something well he's a he's a good example he's a he's an innovative guy and so forth but and he will see as as time goes on he personally will see many of these changes that take place in technology. And in technology, like I said, I, I believe it will become, well, it'll be to the point where uh, all these people that wanted to be applying tattoos by hand, that's all going to be gone, I feel. It'll all be mechanized in some fashion. And I can wax eloquently about that, but I'm not going to because I did a lot of research on it years ago, and I know I, I could have destroyed the tattoo world by by uh, what I learned and experienced and sought after. But I, I abandoned the whole thing because I thought everybody in the world's going to hate me because here's a guy that loved tattooing, and yet I figured out how it could be done. Any fool could make a million dollars doing it the way I'm thinking. And But I don't want that to happen because 
I love the art itself and I love everything about it. So I think, I think people w that with greed on their mind will eventually figure it all out though on how to do, how to do it beyond, above and beyond what we're doing now. And it'll just be so simple and, and uh, be so cheap. Nobody will, I mean, the guys with the, with the, uh, let's say, the guy that is blessed to have the territory assigned to them, they'll all be millionaires. There'll be a few. I could have made them all millionaires, I feel, if I would have pursued this. A, a lot of them, my best friends. But once again, why would I want to do that? I love tattooing, and so I, I want to keep it simple. I like it. I like it the way it is. And I can see, though, that it, it will not stay that way because not everybody's a simple man like me and wants to keep it simple, you know. And so I know the day is coming when it'll all be automated in some fashion. Uh, I, can, I can almost bet a, everything I've got on me that that will happen within, probably within, I'm going to say within 15 or 20 years. Just like they're trying to do away with the electric cars in California, we'll be doing away with that too, as as we know it, within 20 years. I I do believe technologically, and I and I don't like it, but I I know that's how it's going to go. Well, so you basically answered the other question that Franco had. So I'm just going to state it for the yeah. video, but. You've already answered it, so you don't have to go back into it. But his second question was, since you've seen where the tattoo industry has gone over the past 45 years, where do you think the tattoo world is going to say in the next 50? Which yeah. you've basically already just answered. So the next question that I have is from Gabriel Godinez. And he says, with all the experience you've accumulated in the industry and life over, if you could only give three pieces of advice to this new and coming upcoming generation of tattooers, what would you say? Oh, wow. Be, well, the first one would be he probably learned me on. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I guess for people that are absolutely uh, devoted and, uh, and really have the passion, uh, three pieces of advice. Well, number one, I would say don't treat any customer as if you don't need them. Because back to the silly tat little tattoos and stuff, those people will might buy you hamburgers the rest of your life if you treat them right. So, so have respect for any and all that you're requested to apply on their skin. Not that you always have to go along with it. I mean, if it's very offensive or something, uh, well, then obviously that's a different thing. But uh, but then again, anything's gonna be offensive, it seems like, to somebody <laughs> anymore. So maybe you just wanna, uh, you know, follow your own heart in that, in that part. But I, I'd say, don't neglect any, don't pass over anybody as being uh, so fundamental you're not interested. Uh, that's number one. And uh, number two is, uh, for God's sake, don't abandon your family for the sake of tattoos, because tattoos will always be there. But these young cats that want to just absolutely divorce themselves almost from their family life for the sake of their career, that's no damn good either because your obligation is to your family first. And uh, so that's one thing I'd tell them. Don't get so involved in your in, the, in your business, whatever it is, that you're forsaking your, fa your family for for the sake of filthy lucre because that money don't mean shit if you don't have somebody to love. All those kids and uh, 
and that woman that's waiting there for you to get come home, well, she's sacrificing for you to do your thing. So, by the same token, you should you should learn that balance that you need between your career and your family. So that's another thing that young tattooers don't don't uh, keep balanced at all. So that's that's another thing that needs to be uh, attended to, I think. And then uh, I guess uh, for number three. Uh, I don't I don't hardly know what point number three would be. <laughs> All I know is you gotta respect the customer enough to do business with them and uh and then don't forget your family. Those those are the two main things, but as far as tattooing goes, uh uh I would say that you don't want to You don't want to uh, leave anybody with a bad taste in their mouth. And that probably goes back to number one there about give the guy the tattoo he wants. But but if you don't do that, it's going to result in the word of mouth being passed on that don't go back to that guy because, you know, blah, 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 whatever reason they lay on you that you mistreated them or did them wrong or whatever. But it is a, it is very important that you, in my opinion, you don't have to, you don't, literally don't have to kiss their ass, but you, you have to be able to dance with them enough to do good business, you know. So anymore, I, I don't know. I think kissing their ass seems to be like, part of the new game that a lot of them are trying to play, that customers are trying to play. Well, that's bullshit. You know, if you want to, if they, you, you, it's got to be a mutual respect back and forth between you and the customer. And uh, the customers themselves, there's where your livelihood is coming from. And even though you don't relate to a lot of what they're all about, if you can process them with dignity, move them on, <laughs> down the line, well, they may be back. And and quite frankly, you might not care if they ever come back, if they're the wrong type. But as long as you handle them, you know, like I said, with love and respect, let them complain all they want later on down the line. But if you did the best you could, uh, you did your part. You can't, and, and believe you me, you're not going to fix... You're not going to fix all these broken people out there that come in just because they got a fresh tattoo. That that may assist a little bit in, in giving them a little bit of a, a buzz, uh, a little bit of a self-gratification for a while. But because, and it will, because you can't achieve that feeling any other way. You have to get another tattoo to get that 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 gratification there's just something that a satisfaction that comes with that that you can't duplicate so here you, you're going to be uh furnishing them with something for a lifetime maybe and uh hopefully it is for a lifetime the next question i have is also from gabriel godinez he says any regrets in your career so far that you would like to go back and do over? Uh, well, I don't know what I don't know what that would be, except I probably would have if I would have had a place to seek more knowledge. I probably would have, but because of where I was raised. There was I wasn't exposed to professional tattooing at all, so I just started off hand poking because that's what all the neighborhood did, and uh, 
And so I, I, like many others, just started off doing it that way. And But, you know, obviously my life w might have took a completely different turn had I had others, other people to uh, guide me along, you know, but I just floundered along and figured it out, you know, uh, the best way I could. And uh, But I remember Zeke Owen telling me, he said when I, they they gave me a trial at uh, Skid Row downtown Main Street in L.A. They they wanted to see what I could do, and and after after I finished, well Zeke says, "Well, man, it's obvious you know how to tattoo, uh, but I would advise you." He says, "Since you've always worked alone, I would advise you to work with other people for a while." Uh, because you'll learn something from everyone. And so I took his advice, like like he said, and I worked with a couple of other people for a couple of years before I went to East L.A. You know, I, I told him, I said, I'm, as soon as I figure out these machines, I'm just going to go to East L.A. eventually. And he said, well, you should work with other people a little bit before you uh, launch out on your own because you'll learn something from everybody. So that's what I did. I uh, I listened to him, and I worked at the downtown and the and at the Pike for a couple of years, two and a half years, I guess, before I finally went down there to the uh, east East L.A. But I knew that's where I was headed, and uh, but I had even told them in the beginning that's what I was going to do. So Tennessee Dave told Captain Jim, he said, well, he was honest with you. He told you right up front he was going to go to East L.A. And uh, he did. And so, uh, but my experience was like like uh, probably quite a few others who never had anybody to instruct them. And uh, But see, that that was the whole thing being around the professional tattooers that I was exposed to to begin with kind of turned me off, That which is why I didn't really pursue tattooing professionally in a shop for so many years. I just tattooed privately because I didn't like that, their whole approach to uh, the, the, you know, the get over game. It was always just trying to get over on people like carnies to the bone they were, you know. Like uh, Captain Jim would sell them a, the homies would come in, can I get some of that red from you? And he'd fill up a little little uh, ink cap with, with some red dry powder, and he'd give it one little squirt of alcohol. He said, that shit will be dry before they get home. They won't know what to do with it. And, you know, he was, and he'd charge him $10 for it, you know. And then if they bought any black from me, he'd piss in it, you know. So it'd be weaken it, you know. And uh, so uh, uh, there was so many guys like that in the business. And uh, when I watched little Franny put a, a virgin on a guy's back and make her cross-eyed and then giggle about it, man, I couldn't work with people like that. I mean... That was to me what the tattoo world consisted of. It's just a bunch of jive ass people like that, you know? And so I wanted to put real art on people, good art. And uh, and not just try and use the pirate mentality, take all you can and give nothing back, because that was the way they operated a lot. They charge you, you know, all the money up front and then never finish it. They tell you'd come back. They say, "Oh, we'll shade that next week." You'd come back. You, oh, I ain't got time today. Come back next week and this and that. I'd sign that guy. That game played so many times. I never wanted to be like that. You know, I wanted to treat people right, and I, I just didn't see that happen often enough in the tat, tattoo world, which is why it kind of turned me off about. Why do, why do I want to be like those guys, you know? So, I just wanted to do good art. And uh, and and I just like doing black tattoos as well, you know, because it, a lot of people think color 
when they would say, I, I would ask them if you wanted to do it in black or color. And sometimes they go, well, you got color. And I go, yeah, and I regret ever having any of it because it doesn't make tattoos any better just because it's got color, man. It doesn't. And uh, so anyway, I was, a, I was strictly a black tattooer lover, you know, even though I, I got a few colored ones to begin with from all those guys. And then I would size it all up and think, these guys won't tell me shit, you know. I'd get tattooed by them and ask them questions. They wouldn't tell me anything. Gave me the cold shoulder. And so you could do that indefinitely uh, when I was young, you know, because nobody wanted to share the secrets, you know. Just like, for instance, is this your only occupation? Or is this your weekend hobby? Or, you know, a part-time gig? or You know, none of them would answer that. Well, I could have sat in a parking lot with a pair of binoculars and watched them come and go every day. But, you know, that, that just simple things like that, they wouldn't even answer, you know. Who wants to know? And what business is it of yours? And, you know, they, it'd be too personal if you, you know. <laughs> it, well, there was just no way that you were going to get much out of these guys because they weren't giving up anything, you know. Just like little Dave with his chrome contraption, you know. First of all, you got to have one of these, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, so there's so many ways that uh, that tattooing could be presented to you, and I didn't hardly like any of it, you know. All I liked was Bert Grimm, maybe. You know, he wa he didn't appear to be much of a get-over guy. He really wanted to do a nice tattoo, you know. And, and some of the guys I got tattooed by were, were good guys, and, and I realized that. They weren't all flim-flam men, but a lot of them, a lot of those guys were, you know, uh, just trying to... I worked around some of them, and I didn't like how they... Their whole point was just get you in and get you out as quick as possible to set the next guy down. It was just slaughtering chickens as... Kansas City Jack says it's just slaughtering chickens. <laughs> With that being said, <laughs> who I mean, you mentioned Burt Grimm. Yeah. Would you say like, or, or who were some of those people during that time? I guess other tattoo artists that you looked up to when you were starting to learn. Well, uh, I, I mentioned Lou Lewis. Uh, I really liked his. Uh, style of lettering and uh, well I guess at that at the time early on a little bit after Bert I got introduced to Bert actually a few years there but Hardy came on the scene as a very young man around the Long Beach area the Pike area and that's where he got his interest, if you know much about him. Hanging around uh, Burt Grimm's when he was, well, he had his own little club, tattoo club. He drew, all, he drew everything on his friends and, you know, it was so cool. Well, anyway, back in the, back in the day, uh, Zeke Owen was there. Uh, Don Nolan was another one. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, well, God, there's a, there's a list that goes on and on. Rick Walters, he showed up and ran that place for years. Uh, he was a big part of that scene. But back in the day when I, when Bob Shaw and Todd, and Todd, Colonel Todd, took over Burt Grimm's shop, well, Obviously, Bobby Shaw worked there, and uh, and Larry, and Bobby was throwing people out of the shop every day, boxing them out there uh, in front of the shop, and somebody'd come running down and say, "Hey, Bobby's boxing another guy out there out front." You know, it was just almost a daily thing, uh, but. There were so many tattooers that 
that grew up in that place in uh, California, Ralph, uh, let's see, uh, to, uh, let's see, gosh, uh, what, oh, Mark, uh, Mark, what the heck was his last name? Well, anyway, there, there's so many guys that, and then Phil Sims, he's another one. And uh, Flame McNorton, he, I worked with him. And uh, I don't know, there's, I, I guess I could sit down and go make a list out, but there's quite a few guys that, that came through there that really made tattooing what it be, has become. They, it was, the, I, I considered the Pike and San Diego had its own tattoo world and San Francisco as well. But I, I still think Long Beach was being the port of Los Angeles made the difference because there was half a million sailors stationed right there. Half a million at one time. Well, there was a never ending parade of sailors at Burt Grimm's and Leroy Menu. He had a shop right between Burt's and, and uh, West Coast, right in the middle of the block there. And uh, so those three shops were right in a row, right just right there in you know, plain sight of each other. Lou Lewis had had one on the steps at the end of the, uh, the block that Burt was on. And on the other side of that block, Fred Thornton had a shop. And, uh, but at that time, they told me there were 13 shops in Long Beach. Although I didn't go to all of them, but I went to the, a few of them there. Uh, and uh, like I said, I was tattooed in San Diego and Long Beach and downtown as well. Uh, but um, I think I think for me Long Beach was the epicenter of West Coast tattooing. It just is, and I can I can remember it. Uh, all those sailors, never ending. And if it wasn't American Navy, we also had all these. Merchant Marines that were coming around the bend from South America and they just hit Long Beach now and they haven't been anywhere since Peru or somewhere and they've got plenty of money, you know, and all they want to do is get another tattoo and get drunk, you know, and so that was uh, that was another uh, clientele that was a Still, like the Navy, they got a lot of nautical tattoos because they were sailors, you know, they were on ships all the time. So they got anchors and, and mermaids and stuff too. And so that was, a, that was a very good market for tattooing right there for years. And actually, Burt Grimm's shop is the oldest operating tattoo shop in the United States, actually, since 1927, one continuous, you know, operation. And you you just mentioned a lot of, of the old school artists and a lot of the guys that you worked with coming up. I know you know so many people, and it'd probably be impossible to name them all, but who are some of the people that are tattooing right now, some of these modern-day tattoo artists that you're impressed by their work? Well, uh, I could speak about my own family uh, for sure because all of them, uh, they're all just great tattooers. Uh, well, you know, I could go back to, obviously, to Jack, you know, and I could start with him being my first, uh, you know, uh, apprentice, one would say. Uh, but um, but it's it's today in today's world I would say little Chewy Quintanar uh, for sure he really shines I'd say 
and uh, and of course cartoon. Nobody can question that guy's uh, skills. And uh, in fact, he even told me himself that at Jack Jack's wedding, he said, "Charlie, I never really appropriately thank you for." kicking the door open for us Chicanos to be able to make a legal living, you know, uh, doing the art we love and celebrating our culture and everything, you know. And, and uh, so he's another one, obviously. And uh, But there's, gosh, I, I could name off that whole, like Stanley Corona at Tattoo Land. He's phenomenal, and he's, he does so many styles too. Well, that whole that whole shop, I could brag about every one of them. Little Roy and uh, and Brand, Little Brandy there, and uh, well, anybody that's working in that shop, they got my respect. That's for sure. They're all, and they're not all up and comers, but they're all modern day tattooers. They're still at it. Even though some of them have been at it for many years, they're not newcomers, let's say. And as far as newcomers, I I can't really say. There must be a million of them out there. And uh, and I know there's a few that other people might talk about that I've never heard of. And I they show me pictures. And I think, wow, look at this. And I mean, this it's there's no doubt that there's so many good guys out there uh, I'm not I'm just not real sure who's really on the scene anymore because I'm not really on the scene myself uh, except in a well a partial way I'm trapped in the history of it so I can't escape it but uh, but I, I honestly can't say too much about brand new ones because I don't watch all those shows and I don't go to that many conventions to even know who's really got the goods anymore. Uh, of course, like I said, within my own family, I, I realized that, you know, back to Corey Miller, you know, he's another one that, you know, just draws beautiful stuff directly on you and you know, it's just, he's, he's got the touch, you know. And there's, there's a lot of them like that that I could mention from the past. Any more in the new ones? I can't, I can't really talk about because I don't know all that many babies in the business, you know. Right. Even though I meet them every day when I drop in these shops. But, and I, and I see the, I see some of the work they do and it's, it's all respectable. You know, uh, I would say for the most part. I went into one shop not so long ago that I kind of had my doubts about, but I guess there will always be some like that that, you know, uh, you just wish them the best. And you can tell they're not really probably using a lot of wisdom on how they approach people. And, well, I just kind of gauge people by how their shop looks and how they how they receive me. A lot of times when I walk in, I go, "Wow, this don't look very tattooy." You know, it's just like gray walls with like eight paintings on it or something. And and I and I say, "Well, how many paintings you guys sold?" Well, you know, we're artists. I go, "Oh well, I hope the hell you are." You know, <laughs> you put pictures on people, man. <laughs> and so that's another one right there that the, tattooing used to have a certain flavor and the buzz when you walked in is not there anymore because they're all using, you know, silent machines, a little wand or something. And uh, so the buzz is not there. The smell is not there. The... Uh, the ambiance is not there. There's no, there's no flash on the walls. There's no, this just the decor isn't even, it isn't even tattooy, you know. So, 
that's another thing that really kind of rubs me wrong too. I, I just think everything's changing. You know, the, the whole look of, of the business even. And uh, I remember walking into one shop and wow, the entry was probably only a six by six or something. And, and I'm looking at frosted glass, a little kiosk, and it went all the way across. A little gate on the side there and a little hole in the frosted glass so the little cutie with the rose on her shoulder could talk to me. Could I help you, sir? I go like, I, like, I went like that, looked around, and I said, All I'm seeing on the wall is the business license. What kind of place is this anyway? Well, it says tattoos out there. I go, well, where does that happen? And she goes, down the hall. And I go, oh, down the hall. Uh, well, I'll see you. <laughs> and she goes, well, is it, you don't want to know anymore? And I said, I know all I need to know. And I just walked right out. I mean, what the hell kind of a tattoo shop is that? You know, you got a receptionist that's <laughs> unapproachable almost, you know, and then you all, and then it, it's so secretive, everything's hidden, you know. Well, my shop, you remember how it was, you could see, it, unless you put a curtain up for working on the ass or something, you know, those booths were open, man. We weren't hiding anything, and the windows weren't tinted or, you know, mirrored or anything where you couldn't see in. You could, my place was an open book. So that's another thing. Just the, the whole idea of how shops receive you and how they look, even, is so different anymore. It's not even, you wouldn't even have to guess that was the tattoo place, you know. Uh... Well, you wouldn't know anything about it unless it didn't have a sign. But that's another thing too. Is is, is and maybe you're, you'll address that with a question here. We'll see, but I'll talk about it if you don't. Yeah. Well, the the last one I have is uh, a question also from Gabriel Godinez, and he said, "If you could only be remembered." Sorry, I'm going to say that again because I just scratched my nose. But uh, if you could only be remembered for one thing in this industry, as people look back on your career, what would it be? Uh, well, uh, I would like to think at this moment in time that it'll be that they will have a museum to get further educated on. That's my, my desire to, I, I would like to be remembered as the guy that founded the museum uh, for the world's benefit. Uh, that to me is, that's my goal now. Uh, and I, I guess that's my ultimate goal, is just getting the museum established that should be, and I hope to be, have it be a a, a world-class act, you know, a place where people travel from, that's where you go. They know that's where you go. The first national tattoo history museum of America. I'd like to see that happen. And why, why is it so important for you to, to leave a, a physical space like that for people to learn about tattooing? Like, why is that such a goal for you right now? Well, because, uh, I think there's a, a new crowd every day entering this business. And if we have enough knowledge presented to them to learn not only, you know, uh, the history of it all, but the, uh, the, the, I guess you'd say the beauty or the magic of it all, uh, Although there's nothing secret about it anymore, it's just it's just to me. I still think of it as a like a sacred act, 
And uh, that's why I think that uh, it's important to think of ourselves as medicine men. And, uh, and for that reason alone, I think people should be, should know where all this comes from, whether it comes from some guy in the jungle that uh, I couldn't believe one guy that told me when I asked him, I said, let me see that arm. And I looked at the inside of his arm and he had a tattoo there. That I said, where'd that come from? And he said, in the jungles in Nicaragua. And I said, by a native? And he said, yeah, but he had a machine. Uh, he had a, a portable uh, generator he carried around. And, uh, and he would go from one side to the other, from the revolutionaries to the other side, to the Americans that were supporting all the revolutionaries, back to the government forces. He would go from side to side, just like uh, uh, the old German guy uh, that used to tattoo in the Civil War. He would go back and forth from one side to the other because he didn't belong to either side. He tattooed anybody that had the money. Well, I asked this guy, I said, so this guy had those uh, orders, these colors and all this stuff, modern stuff out in the jungle. And he says, well, he said he mixed his own, he makes his own, he makes his own color. And I go, yeah. And I says, out of what? And he said, well, he said out of flowers and moss and different things. And, uh, and I thought, well, oh, man, I never saw colors quite like that. I mean, they were like almost neon, uh, you know, so electric in their appearance. But how do I know he wasn't smashing beetles, wings and stuff? And, you know, I, I don't know, some nut maybe he, you know, found the juice out of or something. I, God only knows how they come up with this stuff, but it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And uh, so, believe you me, tattooing is, it's, it's here to stay. It's everywhere. And uh, it's so, so accessible, so convenient that uh, it's going to last a long time. But not, not necessarily in the, in the way we see it presented now. I think we'll always have skin pictures. But it's going to be replaced with even newer technology that's futuristic. And uh, we'll always enjoy tattoos, but it's just going to be a different, different ball game completely. I'm just going to wait and see. My days are short anyway, and I've enjoyed it all I, as much as one possibly could, I'm sure. I've had a great life. And uh, and I look forward to having a few more years here. But but whatever happens, I'm I'm glad I was here when I was here. And I'll just have to see if he lets me participate in uh, even viewing some of this stuff that's coming down the line. And it's coming. I mean, there's there's too many people in this in this world that want to twist things around and change things up and you know I know it's gonna not be it'll be good for some but not for the for the most I don't think it'll just revolutionize just like everything it's just gonna become I mean I, I used to set my driveway in Kansas every Sunday when I was leaving the house, I would turn on the radio and every Sunday I used to hear the guy talking about wireless phones, wireless phones. I said, who gives a shit about a wireless phone? And look at it. I still don't have one on a personal level. My wife does, but you know, I, I still don't have one. I don't, I don't care what somebody's eating or where they're at right now or, you know, who they're with or, yeah, I don't care, you know. It's just, but that phone seems to want 
make everybody be crazy anymore. They're just, they think that that's life in that phone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think the, the landscape of tattooing has definitely changed and some people's view might be it's changed for the better. Some people might be it's changed for the worse, but I think now and the whole purpose of this channel too is to introduce tattooing to a new light to people that may have never seen it before. And so I think ultimately at the end of the day, you know, like you said, tattooing is, is here to stay and that form may change and it's going to adapt, but they aren't going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's as old as man, you know. In fact, I think God was the first tattooer because it says he put a mark on Cain, uh, you know. So people would recognize that he was, uh, you know, an outlaw, you might say. Uh, so that's it. So it goes back to, you know, one of the first families <laughs> ever. Uh, and God, God put a mark on him. It says I don't know what it looked like, but you know, I don't know if it's an X on the forehead or something. You know, <laughs> like when I was in Costa Rica, those those people down there, they they handle the people that uh, that are thieves there. Well, they cut like a the bottom of your ear off, so everybody will know you're a damn thief. You know. And they, it's vigilante justice, and the cops let it happen, too. You know, they, they go to the cops and say, let me have that guy if he's been arrested, you know, for stealing something. And sometimes they let him. They just cut that ear, snip that ear off. You know. There you go, ladron cabron. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlie, I think we got about everything we needed, you know. So. Yeah. But once again, I just want to thank you for... Not only letting us in your house today to do this interview, but just for everything that you've done for the tattoo industry and all that you continue to do for the tattoo industry. Well, thank you for having me and uh, or for me having you. <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, I appreciate what both of you guys are trying to do. Uh, I think it's really um, uh important for people to know the past and uh, and I think all this documentary type of stuff is going to really be assisting the world to know that's what I, I'd like to see happen with the museum that we have available any type and many different forms of uh, education in, in the way of video, audio and so forth. I, I want it to be so well presented that nobody could walk out of there not knowing anything and everything they might have wanted to know about Cap Coleman or, you know, name anybody out there, you know, that they, they, they could delve into their history. And I was telling Kimiko, I said, I, I kind of like to, would like to see it kind of like porn booths, you know, where you just, you've got like 10 different buttons you can push and 10 different guys you can watch an hour by yourself, unmolested. You can smoke in there even if you want, you know, and, and learn all you want to know about different ones that tattooers that you, and then you can, if you don't like that, you can switch, switch horses, you know, and if you like it, you can go out to the, to the counter and get a CD of that of that program that you just I'd like to get number nine, you know, from booth number uh, or you know whatever that little thing might be called, a little mini theater, <laughs> number ten, <laughs> something. You know, I can see it happening. You know that you could just do that reel after reel after reel, and you know you could in, watch it in private, you know, or take it home, you know. And learn anything and everything about not just individuals, but um, maybe the shops that they had, and on and on and on, all concerning the history, the circus people, and all, and the prisons. I want to address that too, prison tattooing, uh, and have well, have that whole world 
be uh, available to the to the world, you know. So I I can envision so much to do with video and audio that will be educational, and uh, that's the whole goal. Absolutely, we're glad to be a part. Oh, all right, I'm gonna hit stop on this and stop on yours. If you made it to the end of this video, I really, really do appreciate it. It was almost more or less like a podcast just because of how long it was. But the only thing that I have left to ask of you is to go check out the Tattoo Heritage Project. Now, that is the organization that Charlie and some other tattooers have started to get a national tattoo museum started. And towards the end of the video, you can hear really how important it is for him to to get this thing going to really he feels to leave his legacy on this earth so please go visit their website I will leave it in the description and here on the screen and you can figure out how you can contribute that way once again thank you for watching and please like and subscribe but only if you want to